thanks very much. Um, so I'm going to talk now a bit about my research into Scottish medieval, post-medieval window glass, um, window glass specifically from this region. So my main work is scientific analysis of the composition of glass and using that to tell us more about the recipes used to make the glass, the technology, where it may have been made, for example, providing the location of manufacture. So I'm going to talk to you about my work looking at later medieval window glass um, from the region, uh, mainly ecclesiastical, monastical glass. Um, I was originally just going to talk about Perth and Elko sites, but um, I've expanded to include um, St Andrews and Dunfermline, of course, which are in, in the Tafak region. And I'll be looking at where the window glass in the region may have been made and where it may have come from. So there's no evidence that glass was made from its raw materials um, in Scotland, so made by mixing sand and a flux together, melting them to form raw glass. Um, so no evidence it was made until the 17th century, beginning of the 17th century AD. We do have evidence for glass working though, glass recycling, um, colouring of glass right from the Iron Age, so remelting glass to make things like beads or bangles, um, possibly mounts, for example, of Port Mahomet, um, there's a crucible found where glass has been remelted and coloured yellow. In terms of window glass, um, the earliest window glass we have is Roman, so it's found at a number of sites on the Antonine Wall, in relatively small amounts though. And we have early medieval window glass found at the monastic sites of Whithorn, um, and recently identified, um, well, it's been excavated back in the 1950s, but through scientific analysis, it's been identified as being early medieval at um, Iona. So as we move to the later medieval period, and there's no medieval window glass surviving in situ in Scotland. Um, it was all destroyed during the Reformation. So obviously if we go to England, Europe, continental Europe, there's many amazing cathedrals, churches, buildings where we can see original medieval window glass in situ, but sadly not in Scotland. Um, during the Reformation, it was um, likely um, well, destroyed, quite um, yeah, as, as most of the monastic ecclesiastic buildings were in some way. And the window glass and lead probably gathered up to be sold and recycled. The earliest pieces we have in situ are these panes um, from Magdalene Chapel in Edinburgh. Um, and we have some medieval fragments as well that have been reincorporated into new panels, but they're, they're not in situ. However, there would have once been large amounts of glass, window glass used in the medieval period. We're left with these amazing buildings like Melrose, Elgin, St. Andrews, with large window openings. And window glass would have once been a really important part of these buildings. We do find window glass in excavations, and um, not just at the ecclesiastical monastic buildings, um, but also some of the sort of 15th, 16th century elite buildings, um, occasionally tower houses, royal palaces, um, bishops' palaces, for example. What we have left is a, an, a range of um, um, small pieces of broken, usually uh, window glass, usually in very poor condition, usually heavy corroded, um, black on the outside often, with only a small amount of the, of the original glass left in the center. Um, some pieces have signs of decoration, as you can see here. So mainly what we call stick work, um, foliage, lines, dots. Um, there's only a relatively small amount of colored glass, um, we find, um, compared to what you might imagine on some of the colorful window glasses you see in sort of England and on the continent. Figurative glass is very rare. Um, we only know of one piece with a face on it. I think that's from Coldingham. This might be due to how it was destroyed, so did people remove, smash the figurative parts of the windows um, preferentially. Um, but we think most of the windows might have looked something like this um, example here from Poitiers in France. So relatively um, quite white glass, clear glass with lots of decoration. And so if the, um, you know, glass wasn't made in Scotland um, until the um, early post-medieval period, so where did it come from? Um, glass is mentioned surprisingly little in archival documents, although more work is probably needed to look specifically for records for glass. I've collated various archival records from other people's work, and I've spoken to quite a few people as well who are currently doing work um, on trading documents from Scottish ports, but glass does seem to be hardly mentioned. And if glass is mentioned, um, it's not necessarily window glass that's mentioned. It could be bottles or vessels. So obviously we have East Coast ports, Aberdeen, Perth, Dundee, etc., which all extensively traded with the continent. Um, we assume, and it's always been assumed, that glass would come in through the sea routes. But where was it made? Um, we have records, um, exchequer rolls um, for glass importation by Hanseatic merchants, which makes sense, but it's not clear if this is window glass or not. 
And then we finally get custom records specifically for window glass. Um, it maybe tells you where it's coming from, the port is coming from, but it doesn't tell you where the glass itself was manufactured. So where was glass being made in this period? Um, this is a very rough map of known regions for glass manufacture in Europe. Um, we have um, big regions of manufacture in Normandy, so what's in the sort of northwest France. Another big area in Lorraine, which is sort of central eastern France or northeastern France. Um, and then um, areas in sort of what's now current day Germany, um, sort of Bohemia, southern France. And then in England, there's um, man glass manufacture we know in the Weald in Kent, and then also by the 14th century in Staffordshire. So my research was to look at lots of these archaeological samples of glass and analyze them. Um, only a few pieces um, of Scottish window glass have been um, scientifically analyzed in this way since the 1980s, probably sort of about less than 20. Um, so I uh, did a lot of analysis using um, a variety of techniques, um, including portable XRF, scanning electron microscope, and the very long-winded laser ablated inductively coupled plasma mass spectroscopy, um, which looks very much the trace and rare earth elements. And I was comparing the data that I found from the, Scottish, um, from the glass from the Scottish sites with lots of other work that's been done in Europe and um, England, um, similar to compare the results of the glass. Um, I don't have time um, to talk to you um, in great detail today about all the, t oh, so I'm just gonna skim over all the scientific bits um, to talk to you about the results, but you're welcome to ask me any questions about it later. <laughs> but basically, glass is made from, like I said, sand or quartz and then a flux, which in this case is usually a plant ash, tree ash, things like um, fern, bracken, etc. And all these elements um, that I'm analyzing in the glass all come from the raw materials in different ways. And we also get things like um, um, colorants, so copper, cobalt, et cetera, which might color the glass. Um, and we, I was also looking at the rare earth elements, which predominantly come from the sand source. I studied um, 13 sites in Scotland overall, um, over about 250 pieces of glass. Um, I'm mainly going to talk to you today about um, the sites in the region, so the Perth sites, St. Andrews, Elko, and Dunfermline. So this is a very simplified summary of the three regions of Europe where I believe glass was coming to Scotland from in the medieval period. So based both on lots of work done by others in Europe and my own results in Scotland. Again, I don't have time to talk about the nuances, but just to set the scene so I can come on to talk about the, the local sites. So glass seems to have come from three regions. So northwest France, um, being Normandy, um, being the main region, particularly in the 12th and 13th centuries. And the glass coming from here was what we called forest glass. It was very high in potassium, high in things like phosphorus and magnesium as well. Um, we're finding many colors of glass are being made in this region, a whole suite of red, browns, pink, yellow, greens, blues. And glass from Normandy continues to be imported right through until the 16th century, but the really sort of the high point of glass importation is the 12th to 14th century. The second region is central eastern France, Lorraine. Um, Originally, early on in the 12th, 14th century, this was a similar forest glass composition, but much, it gradually increased and changed the recipe by increasing the amount of calcium um, in the glass. We call this a high lime, low alkali recipe. And by the 14th century, um, window glass was being um, made um, also by what we know as the cylinder technique in this region. So instead of blowing a blob of glass um, and spinning it on a blowpipe so it forms a circle, so you've probably all seen like the bullseyes from the center of a, a, a circular pane of crown glass. They were now in the Lorraine region, certainly um, making glass by the cylinder technique, where they're blowing a big long cylinder of glass, laying it flat, cutting it along the log, the log edge, and letting it fall out like that. And we could tell by looking at the glass, looking at the bubbles, the shape of the glass, the edges, um, if it was made by the crown or the cylinder technique. Throughout the period, we also got very small amounts of glass, we think, coming from sort of more Germanic regions. Uh, in particular, a, a type of blue, a nice light blue glass. Um, there seems to be very much a local sort of regional recipe to more the sort of eastern, well, G German areas um, of Europe. Along the bottom um, are um, regional, uh, sorry, are rare earth element profiles of the sand. Um, so basically, each of these three regions does seem to have a slightly characteristic um, rare earth element profile. Um, again, I'm not going to go into the details of quite how all of this works, but it does help us when we analyze the glass determine um, which, um, which area of Europe the glass may have come from. So I'm going to talk about St. Andrews. Um, first, the largest ecclesiastical building to be constructed in Scotland. 
Um, it started to be erected in the late 12th century, um, a number of rebuilds during the 13th and 14th when new glass could have been added. Window glass was founded excavations in the early 20th century and is now in the care of Historic Environment Scotland and the National Museum Scotland. And it was recorded as being found in the north transept. The burnt condition, the stylistic decoration of where it was found um, suggests that the windows were destroyed um, in, in a known event in 1378, um, but was originally most likely to have been installed in the 12th and 13th century. And stylistically very comparable to pieces found in Canterbury and York Minster. And it's likely to be some of the earliest glass I've studied. I had 48 samples and a real mixture of colours, red, blues, yellows, brown, brown, green, pink. I found the three compositional groups I've, always, I've already talked about. By far, the majority were low calcium, high potassium forest glass and likely made in northwest France, Normandy. And this included the majority of the coloured glass. And there was a smaller group with higher calcium and lower phosphorus. So you can see um, the two groups um, that I've identified on this graph here. And this group, the second group, um, is the one that's closer to the y-axis. And then there was a final smaller group, which was just um, two pieces of glass, which is blue glass, which should have disappeared from my graph, but they were up, um, up in this region here, if you can see my mouse on the screen. Maybe not. So these are the two blue glasses I was talking about, blue glass I was talking about, and likely to be from the German, Germanic region. And to emphasize the difference in manufacturing location for these first two groups of glass, we can see here the rare earth element curves. So clearly different sounds from very different locations are being used to make these two different types of glass. So we can see the two geographical sources um, for, for, the, for the glass coming. The blue line is what we think relates to Normandy and the orange line to Lorraine. And finally for this site, um, I also compared the trace elements to glass analyzed from York Minster. So these red dots um, you can see are relate to St. Andrew's glass. And certainly the glass which we would um, identify as coming from Normandy, a lot of it fits really neatly into a circle, um, which, is, um, which is, you can see, says 1290 to 1300. And this is um, glass um, that was analyzed from York Minster from the chapter house, from a panel in the chapter house that's very specifically dated to 1290 to 1300. And this suggests that the glass um, in St. Andrews um, was being made in the same region, to the same recipe, and probably around the same time as this glass that was um, reused in the chapter house during this time in York Minster. Another early site um, with parts from the 12th century still remaining um, is Dunfermline Abbey. Um, we've got very little glass found here, only 16 pieces that are in the collections of NMS. And I could only sample three of these because most of them were on display. Um, they're recorded to being found near the site of the Great East Window and stylistically dated to the early, mid-13th century, although more recently people have looked and suggested they may be later 14th century. So I looked at the three pieces. Um, all three pieces were of the same composition. They were of the northwest France Normandy composition and very similar to that sound found at St. Andrews. Um, and I would sort of suggest... Um, similarly, maybe the dating of this glass is somewhere in between, so maybe late 13th century, um, if you compare it to, to the St. Andrew's glass. So you move on to Perth. Um, the Whitefriars Friary founded in 1262, but we don't know exactly when it was abandoned, but it was definitely attacked and damaged heavily by uh, the, the Perth reformers in 1559. And um, there's a rare, rare reference to window glass being repaired in 1513, when one pound 17 shillings and eight pence um, was spent on a great window in glass. There have been a number of excavations at the site. Um, the glass I looked at came from the 1982 excavations where 104 fragments were found. Um, most were collected near the east wall of the church and may have come from the Great East Window. I analyzed seven samples of glass from this area and two other pieces came from the cloister. So there was clearly a difference in glass from both areas, so except one blue piece you can see that um, was found in the church is in a slightly different part of the graph. So, so most, the majority of them are all um, um, low in phosphorus, sodium, but relatively high in potassium, and all the rest of the analysis suggests they came from the central eastern France um, Lorraine region. The pieces of glass from the cloister are much richer in calcium, this really high lime, low alkali type of glass, and they're very similar in composition to glass that's been found in Belgian windows in situ. There was a study around 10 years ago um, where securely dated windows still in situ in places like Bruges and Antwerp were analyzed. And 
the composition of these small pieces of glass in the cloister and that extra one in the church fit really closely with glass um, decided to be made in Lorraine, central eastern France, between 1477 and 1550. So it's quite tempting to say, is this the glass that was used in the repairs of 1513? And the analysis would fit quite well with that. Um, maybe the piece that came from the church was um, some of the glass used to um, reglaze the cloister, also used to repair some parts of the, of the Great East Window. Um, a, a bit of supposition, but it's interesting to, to do that because we all like to do that as archaeologists. Um, Perth Blackfriars, um, founded in um, 1231, and the church dedicated in 1240. A very well, wealthy monastery in comparison, and obviously the kings of Scotland um, used to reside um, here when in Perth, with um, James I famously being murdered there. And the friary was ransacked, um, like the White Friars in 1559, and reduced to bare walls within days. Excavations carried out in Canoole Street in 83-84 uncovered about 55 fragments of glass um, in association with a building likely to be the cloister, and I sampled 18 of these. Um, Blackfriars is, is, is unusual, and there's a real mixture of glass. There's lots of different types of glass here. It sort of covers almost the whole suite of glass. So we have pieces from Group 1, um, which were clearly um, earlier in date than the rest, being forest glass, high potassium. All the other groups are much higher in calcium, so lime, um, and um, with potassium, as we can see on the graph, um, sort of generally less than 10%. And the second graph um, shows the aluminium and titanium, particularly, which relates again to the sand source. Um, so interestingly, if you can see the group four, um, which is the purple spots, um, is made from a very different sand source um, to all the rest of the glass, which, is, which, is, which is probably all comes from the same region and group four was clearly made somewhere differently. So with Blackfriars, there's still a bit of picking out with some of the results to do, but it was clearly um, made, had glass coming probably from Normandy um, early on, and, um, and then mainly from the Lorraine region as well, but many different uh, periods when glass was replaced uh, in, um, in this particular area. And finally, the last site is um, Elko Nunnery, um, which was founded in 1241 as a Cistercian house. Um, Lady Margaret, the sister of James III, lived there from 1489. The nunnery itself was badly damaged in 1547 by the English and then destroyed during the Reformation. Um, it was excavated in the late 60s and 70s, and 256 fragments of glass were found there, um, all mainly in the interior of the church building. There was also a small amount of lead cane found, as if it was melted. Um, which again suggests, as in many of these buildings, the glass, the lead cane would be melted down, the glass would be gathered up mainly and, and sold on as cullet. As you can see, the glass remains is in very poor condition to, to some of the other sites. Um, but I suppose on the upside, it means there's plenty for sampling, because people tend not to like you sampling the nice pieces of glass with lovely decoration on it. Um, this is some of the glass, again, I could identify by looking at it, that it was made by the cylinder method, so likely to come from Lorraine, because you could see long, thin, sort of parallel, elongated bubbles. So all the glass from Elko was high in calcium, what we call this high lime, low alkali glass, confirms dating of 15th, early 16th century. Um, there are four subgroups, um, but essentially it all comes from sort of the Lorraine region in the, in the late 15th, early 16th century. And again, some of these groups are identical to those that have been found in Belgian windows in situ in the study I referred to earlier. It's actually quite tempting to attribute the glass and was being installed maybe when the nunnery came into a bit of money. So we know James III started paying an annual stipend in 1489 um, when his sister went to live there. So what was found in Belgium and Flanders was very much this cheaper cylinder glass made in Lorraine. Um, it was maybe lesser quality, but it was cheaper and was always used as a primary source of white clear glass. But smaller amounts of maybe higher quality, more expensive glass, particularly colours, was still imported from Normandy. And the fact that the glass used in Scotland during this time, 15th, 30, 16th century, is uh, very similar, comes from very similar manufacturing regions to glass used in places like Bruges and Antwerp, is clearly not unsurprising, um, considering you know, the trading connections that places like Perth particularly had with Flanders. Um, so just to conclude, um, glass was imported, obviously, from a range of European manufacturing sites um, to this region um, in the 12th to 16th century. Um, northwest France, Normandy, central eastern France, Lorraine, and also small amounts coming from Germany. The 12th to 13th century, the glass predominantly came from northwestern France, Normandy, 
with a much smaller proportion from coming from sort of the Lorraine region. But by the time we get into the 14th century, and interestingly, compared to the national picture, this region, this seems to happen earlier in Perth, which again is maybe not totally unexpected. We are getting much more glass from the Lorraine region being used in this, um, in, in, the, in the sort of Perth and Fife area um, by the sort of 14th century. And by the mid-15th century, it pretty much was predominantly coming from central eastern France, Lorraine, with only a small, a very small number of pieces, particularly coloured pieces, that were still coming from Normandy. So, so far we have no evidence of English manufactured window glass. There doesn't appear to be any English glass from what I've looked at so far coming from either the Weald or Staffordshire um, into, into Scotland. Um, so now we know a bit more about where the glass is made, sort of the next step is to look a bit more into trade routes and how did the trade routes change, why they changed. Obviously there's lots of work to compare with what we know about other materials that were imported into this region during the medieval uh, period, and I'd like to do much more at that. Um, looking at more sites, um, potentially revisiting the archival and evidence, um, and yeah, um, doing, doing a bit more work to, to set the scientific results from the glass into um, the, the, the bigger picture of sort of trade in the medieval period in this region. Um, and just thanks to um, various people who helped me during my PhD when I was doing most of this research. Thank you very much.